I want to give you some simple suggestion on how to read and understand mainly clinical papers more than preclinical. The reason is because I'm a physician, uh, so I was not exposed to, to the lab, and so any suggestion on lab study will be based on reading other papers. Uh, but that's not a good example of teaching. Uh, and uh, as a science, that's the other part of my background. Uh, I'm more involved uh, in the methodology of uh, clinical research and uh, on uh, EBM. And then I would like to take a few slides uh, to give you a right definition of EBM to give you uh, some uh, ideas of what means uh, clinical research methods and also what we have to consider clinical studies because it's simple to think about simple say from for a physician to think about a lab but from the clinical point of view we are prone uh, to think about drugs, uh, but that's not only uh, the only research uh, on the clinical point of view. What EBM is, uh, that's the starting paper of EBM. And at the beginning, that's the definition, a new approach to teaching the practice of medicine. So that's the beginning. It's a new way to teach, to educate physician. That was done in a university, the McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. There, there was Gordon Guyot that was cited in the presentation before. And to be honest, the, the, the father of EBM is David Suckett. But Gordon Guyot was a good friend and was a who develop the, the, the initial thought about what evidence-based is. And this uh, medicine based on evidence was uh, created because uh, in the past we wanted to teach medicine, to practice medicine, sometimes based on dogma. Oh, there is a lot of dogma in, uh, also in the societies. For example, natural is best. And I always say that the main reason of skin cancer is the sunlight that is more natural than other things. And the same is for some mushrooms. If you want to eat an Amanita phalloide, you will die in a few days. And that's natural, completely natural. Then uh, EBM was created uh, because uh, we are always done in that way. So why we have to do this? Oh, it's uh, the professor who say that. Based on what? Based on experience. Based on uh, our rules. Our school our way of thinking and practice medicine. Or everyone does it this way. So it's difficult to have a conflict with another colleague because uh, that's the conventional way of uh, working. So it's better not to say something different. Now we are allowed to say Oh, based on data, based on evidence, I want to practice medicine in this way. So it's really important to produce data in a good way. And also it's uh, uh, necessary to read this data in the right way. Based on this, Gordon Guy at David Sacker say, uh, we have to start from data and we have to go back to the patient. But we have to critical appraise uh, what we are doing. So data 
look at the literature, go to the patient and say, oh, I'm doing well or not. And so you have seen the evidence pyramid to say, okay, expert opinion, but I have to increase my quality of evidence, and so that's really important. Data, produce good data, read good data, and also try to have the best message from the data. To produce data, the last century was very wonderful. It was wonderful from the medicine point of view. So remember, just the end of last century, century, you can see antibiotics, you can see transplantation, you can see insulin therapy, you can see coronary stents, you have the genoma project, incredible. And there was also in parallel an increase in research methods starting from the first large-scale randomized controlled trials, BMJ, 1948, streptomycin treatment for pulmonary tuberculosis, the first modern randomized controlled trial. And there was an evolution from that. We are now to measure not only efficacy, so the effect of an intervention in the hypothetical world of randomized control trial, so ideal patient, not daily patient. And now we are trying to see if uh, an intervention works when used in usual condition of care. So we are trying to measure effectiveness. And so the trial are trying to be more pragmatic as possible. So more uh, similar to what is going on every day in every clinical unit. That's an example. And there was also an evolution of EBM. So I have seen, you have seen before. So not only evidence, but remember individual clinical expertise. But of course, it's not something new so you have to use and you have to say, oh, what I have learned in the past does not have any value, but you have to integrate. You have to integrate also with your patient because it's unbelievable, but we treat patients. So we have to ask an informed consent in some cases before treating him. What about clinical study? So probably you have seen a, a picture like that. So we start for drugs from preclinical studies, and we arrive to the market, so the, the phase four trials. And that is necessary. That is necessary, and so we start from uh, toxic potential, and so we have to exclude that or many of a potential toxic effect, and I will not go in details, because many in this room knows better than me how to do that studies. And then we have to go to phase one, usually on healthy volunteers, and to phase two, to select the best dose of a drug, then the, the big, trials that we call usually randomized controlled trial, but they are usually the phase three trials that are necessary for have an indication. And we usually in the modern era speak about thousands of patients a role, also 10,000 of patients in some setting a role, starting from 10 people, 20 people, and then the market also to look in if in the, in the real life something is going wrong or also good. So to give you numbers, we start from thousands of molecules to have one drug approved. 
and speaking in terms of years, more than 10 years. So means time, but time in the modern era is money. So a lot of money to do this process. And so you, you have an immediate feeling what means in terms of potential conflict of interest when you are the prescribing physician at that time. I have spent a lot of money, I spent a lot of years, please prescribe my drug. Why? Based on evidence or not? So I have to read carefully what is published on that drug, but not only on drugs. Hot topic, vaccine. Devices, no good regulation, rules on how to have uh, uh, devices on the market. There's no this long process. And also surgery. Someone say, oh, it's difficult to do a randomized control trial on surgery. It depends on the surgeon. That's the main important uh, skill in defining what is good or not. So there was, uh, you, you know better than me, recently published on New England Journal of Medicine, the long-term outcomes of the randomized controlled trial for appendicitis, antibiotics versus surgery. So that was a good example of how to start also good uh, uh, trials also in this sector. And then there is clinical epidemiology, uh, probably also the father of clinical epidemiology is David Suckett. And so what does it mean? It means that randomized controlled trials are a type of uh, clinical research. It's a type of experimental study. And then there is uh, all the observational study. And I will show you in the next slide that for the appropriate question, we have the appropriate methods of research. It depends on our clinical question. So let's go in detail to the main point of the presentation. These tricks are not only for reading clinical papers, but also to prepare a protocol. And so that's the necessary steps uh, to look at. First, most important, you have to learn to mm, prepare. You have to learn how to ask you. You have to learn how to have in mind the good question, also the right question, because not always a good question is a right question. You have to think about the patient you are reading or you want to include in a protocol. And then from this, it's quite easy to select the good study design. The problem of outcomes, is, it's a current problems. Then something that sometimes is downgraded and say, oh, it's only for fans of mathematics or statistics, I don't like to, to do uh, some calculation the software will do for me, but it's real important. The sample size is uh, the, the, the most important steps after the good question. And then uh, the analysis. Because uh, a, a smart statistician can do everything with data. Everything. Trust me and give you a negative or a positive result. As uh, Rita said, we have to find in the paper bias. What bias are? Bias is an influence that can make our study result not true. So I want to have a true message from 
my paper, from my reading the paper. And so, if I read, oh, this uh, technique, this drug, this uh, mm, diagnosis test uh, is better or not of the other one. A lot of bias. I will not go in details, but remember, if I'm, uh, uh, let's say, try to uh, investigate the effect of a drug on mortality, uh, of course, if I select uh, an healthy population or if I select a very sick population, I will have a different results. But we'll go in detail on each step of the trial. So, starting from the good question is the first point. So it's really important in life to ask the good question. May I go to the bathroom? That's the first question. It's good. And always the answer is no, stay there. Because that's a not a good question. Teacher, I feel very sick. I have to go out. May I? Oh, yes, call the mom. Let's go home. So it's real important to ask the good question in a good way. It's important to have in mind also our aim. So which unmet clinical need question has been investigated? And so you have to keep in mind that we have four types of clinical questions. And so the paper has to answer, you are reading, one of these four questions. These four questions are the daily clinical questions, are about association. So is air travel, contraceptive pill, associated with venous thrombosis. Oh, a lot of example will be in the thrombosis and hemostasis field because uh, I'm used to treat this patient. Is a diagnostic question. Is spiral CT, angel CT, uh, a good way to diagnose PE? Prognostic, the most difficult question to answer also daily to the patient. I will survive. There will be any complication. Can a score predict uh, a survival? And then the, the, the main question, or I will say the question I'm usually better exposed, and we know most of them, or it's most important for us, course, uh, because uh, the aim of a, a physician is to treat patient, not to make a diagnosis. The only physician whose aim is to do the diagnosis is uh, Dr. House. For Dr. House, diagnosis is the, is the aim of his activity. But for the, the rest of the world, we have to treat uh, in the better way our patient. So does uh, an oral anticoagulant better than low molecular weight heparins uh, to prevent thrombosis post-surgery or not? And you, you see efficacy. Because in the setting of a trial, that's uh, in an ideal setting, so we can give information and data on an efficacy. A complete therapeutic question should include uh, Population, intervention, and outcomes. So I will back in one second. That's the PICO or the PICO rules. So always have in mind. Also, when you are at the bed of your patient, patient, intervention, what I would like to do, what is tested in this paper, what I will test in a new protocol, comparison, and outcome. And so uh, the modern way is also to add an S. S is study design. So 
patient intervention comparison outcomes. That's an example. Patient, inpatient with cancer, New England Journal of Medicine, low molecular weight heparin intervention versus coumarin comparison, and the outcome for the prevention of recurrent venous thromboembolism. So we know, reading only the title, the PIKE. So I want to know the effect of low molecular weight appearance in cancer patient. I will read this page. I want to know the effect on low molecular weight appearance on uh, inpatient with other fibrillation. That's not my paper. So the effect in the population and also the outcome. Prevention of recurrence. But I would like to read them out mortality. I don't know if mortality is the primary outcome. Probably no. Or another example to compare the efficacy. So the same. Efficacy will be determined by the rate of acute VT and safety by bleeding. Which kind of question is this uh, publishing in JAMA? Therapeutic, prognostic, etiology. Wealthy. One of the ladies. <laughs> Sylvia. That's a, a diagnostic management study. So effectiveness management study. So in the real life, almost real life, of managing, so management study, suspected pulmonary embolism using an algorithm combining clinical probability, D-dimer testing, and computed tomography. Based on this paper and other papers, nowadays we use computer tomography to diagnose PE. So that's a diagnostic study. So answer a diagnosis question. So it's really important to recognize the type of question and it's not easy. That's an example. Which kind of question is? Therapeutic. And we have the PICO inside it. We have the PICOS inside it. And so aspirin and clopidogrel intervention versus clopidogrel alone comparison. After recent ischemic stroke or trans ischemic attack in high risk patient, randomized double blind placebo control trial. So we know also the type, the study design here. So we have not to read the abstract and all the paper, but from the title we can say, oh, I will read it or I will pass to the next uh, paper. And that's really important. Just a question. Usually you read the background, the methods, the findings, and the interpretation. Raise your hand. Who reads mostly the interpretation of the, the abstract? Findings? Methods? Background? Usually, usually, most physicians read only interpretation. It's very difficult that someone read the methods. That's it's the most important part. And also the result. This is a, so the, in, in Lancer, they are honest. They say interpretation. So it's subjective. But if we want to find bias, we have to use objective. That's really important. Then you have to ask yourself, mostly before start, starting a, a new protocol, a new study, but also reading the paper, 
if there is a, a clinical or biological rationale. Oh, why are you s saying that? Of course, if I want to start a new study, there is a rationale. Uh, I want to tell you a, a story. I, I don't know, uh, because I always take the example of skin cancer. But uh, there is a physician who read in a paper that uh, skin cancer is associated with blonde hair. Is that true? No, it's, it's true. It's associated. It's not the cause of skin cancer. It's true. It's associated. And of course, what means association? That does not mean cause. But that was strange, that physician. And you say, oh, my son, my daughter has blonde hair. I will, and say, oh, maybe it's better to protect her from sunlight. And it was very strange to say, oh, well, I will use an helmet. And, and the, the daughter was astonished. I don't understand my father. And at the end, they say, oh, also the other son is better to cover them. I don't know. I read that paper. There is an association. Oh, it's a funny story, of course. Myocardial infarction and menopause. That's not a story. That's reality. A lot of women with HRT, of course, till this trial was published in 2002. And so with hormonal therapy and increase of coronary heart disease and increase on stroke and increase in pulmonary embolism and increase in invasive breast cancer. So the story of medicine, also the recent story, it's based sometimes on a bad interpretation of data or in a simple interpretation of data. And that's really important. And then you have to ask yourself a lot of additional questions, in particular if you want to write a protocol. I have the necessary time, I have the necessary money. Oh, I have heard a lot of uh, old professors, they say, oh, I have no time to do this long course study. So please start you. I have no time. I am not willing. I have no, I don't know. And also money. Oh, I would like to do uh, an international randomized control type. You need billions, <laughs> at least of uh, euros uh, to do an international randomized control trial. And then it's the ethical. That's n the last, but not the least. And it's not easy, but we have you have discussed this aspect in the previous uh, presentation. And so my please remember there is a ethical committee with uh, pros and cons, but there is a, so before starting a study, you have to send a clinical study to the uh, ethical committee. And please, if you do a study, there is some rules. That started from Helsinki, there was an evolution, but please keep in mind, before and during the study, there are some rules. Some rules, not only to be honest, and that's not a minor point. But also to uh, produce good, yet good data. Because a study not done in a good way produces bad data. Patient population. And so when I read the paper, I say, oh, it's this population similar to my patient, to the patient I want to treat. It's 
too difficult for me to say that in English, generality or something like that. There is a scheme in every paper. Please read it. Inclusion, but also exclusion. So, how many papers, pa patients, how many excluded, eligible to be included, agree to participate, do not agree. So, look at the number. Do not agree. Why? They are excluded. Why? So, please read this. Not included in the act in the upset, this data. So you have to go to the paper to read all these data. How many excluded? If uh, more than 50, pay, uh, 50 uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, inclusion criteria, you have thousands of patients potentially eligible and you, alpha the patient, are excluded. Do you think it's a good paper, it's a good study or not? It could be a good study. But there is a, a limitation to apply this data to the general population because alpha of the general population has been excluded. Does not mean it's the bad study, but probably there are two strict inclusion and exclusion criteria to be applicable to all patients I see every day. Then you have to read the mean age. Children, elderly, usually elderly patients are excluded. Or some studies are done on elderly patients. I don't know, you have to read or Listen that they were published in New England Journal of Medicine, the result of aspirin in primary prevention in the elderly. So negative findings. It's incredible. So I don't have the answer for the children, but I have the answer for the elderly. Gender. Some are only for male and some are only for female. Race. Some uh, hypertensive drugs uh, does not work in some races. Disease, how I diagnosed that disease, which is the severity, is a mild renal insufficiency, is a severe renal inf insufficiency. Which kind of patient? Patient uh, admitted in the hospital. Patient uh, see by the general practitioner. Comorbidity. Healthy patient or with uh, renal or uh, hepatic or heart uh, disease. And then look, was the study uh, submitted to the ethical committee? The patient signed an informed consent or not? So look at the population, which kind of population has been included. How to define the study design, the good study design based on the question on the patient population? You have to ask yourself, any kind of intervention, the time in which the study has been performed. So there is an active treatment, experimental. I observe what is going on. I observe, I try to modify the reality. And the time, it's a video or it's a picture. And that's important. And the video could be retrospective or prospective. So, I want to uh, give a new test to the patient. I want to do a, a, a new intervention of this kind of patient. I want to use a new technique. That's a, an experimental study. I want to see what's going on. That's an observational study. Is there a control group? Oh, yes, it's an analytic study. No, it's a descriptive study. And in the descriptive study, we have the 
the case series, mainly in the analytics study, we have the cohort, the case control, and the cross-sectional is in between. Very easy. Intervention. Is there a control group? No. It's a single arm study. There was a randomization, yes, a randomized controlled trial. A trial without randomization. All these are clinical studies. We know a lot about uh, randomized controlled trials, but all these studies are really important for daily life. And Gianmarco Podda, later on, will go in details of this scheme. If I want to study therapy, the best study design is the randomized controlled trial. If I want to look at the prognosis, the core study is the best one. If I want to look at the etiology, or a case control or core study is the best one. If I want to look at the best test for diagnosis, the management study of a randomized control trial. They are good example, also randomized control trial to do diagnostic techniques, also for diagnosis. Just one question, etiology, case control or core study. When I use a case control or a core study, and uh, the, the classical example is uh, smoking is associated with lung cancer. It's better a case control or a core study? The answer is always, uh, as in primary school, it depends. If the outcome is rare, we have to start from the outcome. That means Case. So case control is the uh, risk factor is rare. We have to start from the risk factor. And, and that's the rule. Otherwise, we will not reach, for example, if you want to see a risk factor for, uh, let's say, lung cancer, it's better to start from lung cancer and to have a control, a patient without lung cancer, to go back to see if there is uh, smoking. But of course, I can start from a, a group or cohort uh, of physician who smoke and do not smoke, that's the historical court of the British physician who are smoker or were not smoker, which for the first time there was in the association with lung cancer. But let's go on. Outcomes. It's important to recognize there is different ways to say, oh, these drugs, this intervention, it's good or not. And there are two groups of outcomes. So the clinical and non-clinical. That's an example for VT. Clinical could be deft, fatal PE, symptomatic PE, or symptomatic DVT. Non-clinical, you can have the venographic DVT asymptomatic, echographic DVT asymptomatic, CT diagnosed be asymptomatic, or you can use a coagulation test such as D-dimer. So you read the paper and you try to find the primary outcome. So which is the primary outcome of your study? It's a clinical outcome or it's a non-clinical? If you are a patient, you prefer a clinical or a, cl a non-clinical outcome? Clinical. If you are a patient, you don't know what is it, a non-clinical outcome, because you are asymptomatic. So you are not ill. You have nothing. 
So from the patient perspective, the clinical outcome is the best. And from our point of view, which is the best? It depends. Of course, the ideal outcome should be clinical relevant. Mortality is the best outcome. No way of discussion. The patient is alive or dead. Sometimes Mario is deciding his life or death. Or organ transplantation, of course. But it's very easy. No matter of discussion. No test to be performed. And it's zero, one, black and white. And also patient that uh, it's really uh, involved in this outcome. High prevalence, easily measurable, plausible in pathophysiology. So, all clinical outcomes are ideal, not. And that's the reason because uh, in many cases, uh, some surrogate markers, uh, some non-clinical outcomes are used. Clinical outcomes have usually a low incidence, fortunately. And uh, low incidence, what does it mean? Means to increase the sample size. We'll do some exercise later on. Increase study duration. And if you have an increased study duration and large sample size, you can miss a lot of patients. It's not good also to miss patients. Because at the end, they say, oh, you have missed a lot of patients. So it's not a good study. So it's always a balance between choosing clinical and non-clinical outcomes. If you use for a, a, a cold, a flu mortality, how many patients you have to include? Of course, for a septic shock mortality, it's the only one uh, outcome you have to measure. It depends also on the severity of the disease. Non-clinical outcome may be useful, therefore, when the natural history of disease is clear, there is a high test accuracy, and is less invasive for the patient. Oh, that's really important. That's the example of venographic or echographic DVT. Which is better? The better accuracy is for venography. No matter of discussion. But we have to insert a contrast medium, and it's very easy to do in echography nowadays. Of course, if you are a patient, look at the mortality. And that's another critical point. Many studies, in particular in the cardiovascular setting, there is a combination of clinical outcomes. Is it possible to combine outcomes? So, a lot of cardiology there. There is the may match it. So, major adverse cardiovascular events. So, it's a combination of myocardial infarction, or let's say acute coronary syndrome with ST, without ST elevation, with revascularization, mortality, heart failure, uh, all the, the cardiological outcomes are combined together. Is it possible from the methodology point of view to combine outcomes? You say, oh yes, because uh, the, the big trialist has done that in the past. You can combine outcomes based on two rules. The frequency of each outcome is similar or the same. And you can combine outcomes if the severity of the outcomes is very similar. That's really important. Otherwise, the results are drive by one outcome. And it's not a real combination. 
sample size. Ideally, we have to include all the population in the world. We have to do a trial on hypertensive patients. We have to include all the hypertensive patients. It's not possible. That's the reason to calculate a sample. And so the sample size, how I try to say, to answer my question, I need this number of patients for two reasons. One, I don't want to include too many patients, so money and time, but I do not want to include a lower number of patients needed to answer my question. Otherwise, I waste time and money. So I have to calculate this correct number. And to calculate the sample size, I need to establish the alpha and the beta arrow, but that's always the same for every sample size calculation with a slight little different. But you have to estimate the events and also the effect. Let's go step by step. Alpha error is the probability to conclude for an effect when it is not. The famous p-value less than 0 0.05. So, 5% of probability to have a false positive result. It's, it's a convention. Mm, do you believe this 5% is low, is high? It's better to have 1%, it's better to have 20%. If you are a patient and the surgeon say to you, oh, we'll do this intervention, you have the 5% of probability that's not the good intervention, you say, oh, good or no? Or I will give you this drug, I don't know, I have the 5% probability to say that the effect is not for you. Usually, the drug uh, uh, agency, FDA, EMA, and so on, sh should approve a drug when there is two study with a 5% probability or say that there is no effect. There is an effect when it's not there. There is too much 5% to accept a new intervention of drugs. Beta arrow, probability to conclude for a lack of effect when it is false negative, less one, sorry, one less beta is the statistical power of the study. So when you have a large confidence interval, you say, oh, it's not statistically significant. When I see a large sample size, I say the statistical power is very low. That's important. If you have a large, a wide confidence intervals, means that few patients have been included. So you cannot say nothing about that. You have to increase your population. So if we set the alpha arrow 5%, one less beta, 20, 10%. And we estimate the effect of the new drugs as with the new drugs, I will reach in half of the events than in control groups. So that's my control population. That's my intervention population, 30, 15. 16, 8, 4, 2. So there is a decrease of 50% with the new drugs. Look what happens to my sample size. So it depends, the sample size, also on the event rate. If it's frequent an event, I can include 
low number of patients. If it is infrequent the event, I have to include thousands of patients per group. And if I change these uh, slides into these, uh, in which pulmonary embolism control group intervention, look, right ventricular dysfunction, it's a marker, it's a non-clinical outcome. Death and recurrence, it's a combined outcome, or deaths, look at the sample size. So based on your choice of the outcome, look what is changing. That means time and money. And so there is some tricks. Think about thrombolysis in pulmonary embolism for many years based on right ventricular dysfunction and not on mortality. And that's a ser real important. That's another choice. That's another reason to uh, calculate the sample size. Because uh, if I do a low number of experiment, uh, it's like to uh, play with a coin 10 times. Uh, it's possible that cross uh, every 10 times uh, is the answer of our coin. So keep in mind. Last part before a long conclusion part is the analysis. So that's that's the fishing for p value. You know better than me when you have a statistical software, it's like to receive a. a, a PlayStation on Christmas. Let's play. That is very dangerous. Because, and I will go back, per definition, 1 over 20 analysis is positive. What does it mean? 5% probability to give a false positive result. That's the alpha error. If you repeat analysis of per definition, one will be positive, only for statistical reasons. But go back and try to reach that step. You have to look which kind of population has been analyzed. You have to look if adjustment has been done for possible confinder. You have to see if a, a subgroup secondary analysis or something others. And then let's speak about a little bit non-inferiority and superiority trials. There is two types to be uh, short uh, in my presentation, which usually randomized control trial are analyzed and the intention to treat and the prayer protocol analysis, which is better. So in the prayer protocol analysis are analyzed all patients that have followed the protocol. So it's an ideal population. It's better to read the intention to treat or the prayer protocol analysis. Why? It's more realistic, and because uh, we want only one intervention in our trial, the randomization. We want to, we want to keep the randomization uh, as really is, uh, a random selection. Because uh, the reason for not following the protocol could be long list, and some of them are really detrimental for the patient if we analyze only the protocol analysis. Could be side effects. So, was stopped to take pills, so was out of the protocol because there were side effects. 
or no compliance. This is the reason of no compliance. Maybe for some, uh, some side effects. So I want to read the analysis for all the population. That's the best way to have good data. And I important to read how many patients have been excluded to have a real idea of what I'm going to read in that population. And then you have to read how many patients were not compliant, when, how many patients were lost to follow up, how many are out license, lost to follow up. How many patients, which percentage you accept of good to lost to follow up? No patient. If you read in a paper that no patient was lost to follow up, it's a good or a bad uh, trial? Probably, but it depends. Depends on the follow up. If you have uh, five days follow up, it's Probably it's true. If you have five years follow up, it's not true. It's impossible. So it depends from the methodological point of view, of course. And it depends also for many other reasons. It's good or not to do a secondary analysis? Of course, I prefer the primary analysis, the analysis done on the primary outcome because there is a rational, because I built my uh, study on that uh, outcome. Uh, of course, uh, there are cons, uh, so fishing for p-values, p uh, but there are some pros. New ideas are generated or there is new questions if you look in details at the data. So it's good in some way. That's the reason because a lot of secondary analysis have been published. And then I can, um, from the diagnostic point of view, find a new cutoff point or find some idea for new test. That's a not topic. That's a not topic because uh, till now, Till a few years ago, new trials tested only superiority. That's uh, intuitive. I want a new test, a new drug, a new intervention that is better of the old one. So I want to show that it is better. In the last year, have been published a lot of known inferiority trials. So my test, my drug, my intervention is not inferior than the previous one. Do we agree that's a possible way to conduct study? You are in favor or you are contrary to this way? Or it depends? It sometimes it depends, and there is a big debate on that. There is some, uh, let's say, radical position. That's a famous paper published from the Mario Negri Institute. They say non-inferiority trials are unethical, unethical, no discussion because they disregard patient interest. Just for information, probably all of you know the new oral anticoagulants, so DOACs, all the randomized controlled trials are non-inferiority trials. All, no exception, all non-inferiority trials. And many of you prescribe oral anticoagulants. Someone says, oh, dear colleagues, what about if I show them an antibiotic therapy for tuberculosis is non-inferior 
for a short period, then a, a six-month period to reduce adverse events and to save money, especially in the developing countries where it is a problem. So there is a less radical position and there is also a less radical position of the Italian agency of the regulation of the drugs. If the, the study may have some advantages in terms of compliance, cost, formulation, or some administration ways, I don't know which is your position, but that's not time to discuss that. We only show you uh, the statistical issue of known inferiority. Look at this paper. So, not all known inferiority results are, are equal. So, that's is a study that show a superiority or a non-inferiority? A superiority. Yes. The new drug intervention is better than the old one. There is no uh, crossing of the null line. So it's better. This is a super, superior, non-inferior, you don't know. Back one second. I miss one point to show you. How can I define a treatment non-inferior to another one? New line, superior, the extreme, the upper, extremity of the confidence interval does not cross the new line. When I do a trial of known inferiority, I usually set down this delta. And I say, I can conclude that the new drug is not inferior to the old one when the upper limit of the confidence interval does not cross this delta. I accept that the new drugs does is not can be uh, worse than the old one of a delta. This could be 5%, 10%, it depends. I accept that could be worse than so I have to set down this delta. So the second case is uh, this study is uh, non-inferior because uh, the upper limit does not cross uh, the delta. This is Yes. Yes, uh, Professor Cosentino is right. I would like to show you that some statistical tricks uh, are used to set down this delta and not based on clinical consideration. If you look at the delta of the non-inferiority study of the dogs, are all different. And so the question is why? Let's go on. So the new treatment is not superior, but is non-inferior. This is not superior and not inferior. And this is, at the same time, inferior and non-inferior.
That is possible, of course, uh, if a role a lot, a huge amount of patients, because this uh, confidence interval should be very, 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 very strict. Otherwise, it's not possible. But from the theoretical point of view, I can conclude both with these results. What happens with delta? If I set delta near the new line, my sample size increase or decrease? Or vice versa. If my delta is very far from the null, the sample size decrease or increase? So far, sample size, decrease or increase? Decrease. Because if I have my delta near the null, it's a superiority study. So the known inferiority study are done to decrease the sample size. That's not the main reason, but they are used to save money and time. They have been used for antihypertensive drugs. How many hypertensive drugs we have? And many of these drugs have been licensed based on non-inferiority study. So we have a lot of antihypertensive drugs, one similar to the others. So the, the famous Me Too drug, the company say, oh, Me Too, I want to. Not only as Argento. Me Too, I want this new drug. But that's a problem because new oral anticoagulants are non-inferior to Warford. That's the conclusion. But in the next year, we will have a new, new oral anticoagulants. So please tell me which is the control group. It's the DOAC or it's Warford. Because at the end, we will have a new, new oral which is inferior to the new oral, which is inferior to warfarin. So the delta go far away is line. So it's a statistical issue that came back to the ethical issue. It's not possible to separate these issues. So my long conclusions, along because I will show a video. It's not a friend of mine, but I feel it's a friend of mine. I want to show you a good example of Italian research, because we speak about always about stamina. But you say you know that there, there was the Zamboni methods, and so some Zamboni say I, I will. Uh, treat the multiple sclerosis, uh, treating uh, venous insufficiency. They say, oh, it's not true. If you do a meta-analysis, there's no data about that. What da have done Zamboni? Zamboni say, Let, let's do a randomized control trial because I believe in it. And so he, he called uh, uh, the maximum expert of methodology and multiple sclerosis in Italy, not only clinician, but also methodologists. Many of them are friends of uh, Rita Banzi. And uh, this trial was published in January this year. It's not JAMA, it's uh, JAMA Neurology, but it's very high impact fat. Honestly, Zamboni say venous PS proven to be a safe but largely ineffective technique that cannot be recommended to patients. That's a real, a good example. We have to follow these rules. 
And so in TV, we always speak about uh, stamina, but we have to speak about sometimes of Zamboni. Very honest physician and research. Few years ago, that's just to say the case reports is very important. Please remember, HIV was discovered by a case series in Philadelphia. And that's a Angelman, Sir Angelman, was a pediatrician. He came to Verona in 1965, one years before, and look at in the museum, there's a boy with a puppet, and say, oh, I have three children. They are very similar. And for the first time, describe that was later on defined the Angelman syndrome. Mainly a delection of the chromosome 40. That's unbelievable. But research is also based on observation. The cardiologist knows the IDA syndrome, stenosis of the aortic valve, described by a general practitioner in the U England Journal of Medicine. He say, read that paper. I don't know why, but my patient, two patients with aortic stenosis with intestinal bleeding. I don't know why. Please research and study that. That's a wonderful letter. I'm honest, I treat patients, don't do research. You know how to do research, please do that for me. And then I'm always uh, happy to present this paper. At the end, everyone in the world uh, will know this paper. That's a wonderful systematic review published on BMJ, uh, in which uh, there, there is a, a FICO question. So paracute use uh, prevent that major trauma related to gravitational challenge. And, and they were astonished because uh, uh, no randomized control trial had been published on that. And say, uh, what to do, do now? We have to do a randomized control trial because uh, uh, no has not been subject to rigorous evaluation by using randomized control trial. So, advocates of evidence-based medicine, I started from EBM, so I'm really a fan of EBM, have criticized the adoption of intervention evaluated by using only observational data. So it's time to do a randomized control trial. But be aware, which is the best randomized control trial? Which design is the best one? The crossover design. Please, if you receive a paracute, go back with me with the airplanes next time without paracutes. So not always can be tested with the randomized control trial. That's really important to have in mind. I will show you a presentation done by a traumatologist this is one of the, the trialists that do uh, this wonderful trial on trauma patient. You know then in trauma patient there is a coagulopathy. There is a big discussion on the causes of this coagulopathy. Uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, DIC, there is the, the the illusion, the hypothermia, the acidosis. Uh, till a few years ago, that was the treatment. A lot of black bags, 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 bags. So blood, 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 blood. Till this randomized control trial, the CRASH-2 study published eight years ago. 20,000 patients randomized to two vials of tranexamic acid probably less than one euro, less than one euro. It's a very old drug. It was uh, unbelievable. With two vials, there is a decrease in mortality of almost 2%. Absolute 
risk reduction, 2%. Unbelievable. The tranexamic acid was done on the road, the beginning, so start tranexamic acid. And so all over the world now is used. But there were some problems because uh, some researchers do not believe about these data. And so I will show you how Karim Roy teach you how to miss reading his paper. Just one second to start with the internet. Let's try. He wanted to give for quite some time, so uh, I'm really pleased to be able to give it at smack. Scott Weingart is awesome. <laughs> Cliff Reed is awesome. John Hines is awesome. A lot of you are awesome. I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> I find it good that I can look at a patient and know what's wrong with them. I can feel their gestalt. I can bake bread with them. It's good to know when you've got a patient in your hands and you just know what is right and you know how to look after that patient and you know that when you put your hands on that patient, they will get up again. So it's inconvenient when people present you with things like evidence. that gets in the way of what I know and what I feel and what I want. It's even more inconvenient when, let's call them foreigners, present you that evidence. When they do some half-baked study and they use a drug which they tell me has actually been around for quite a long time. It's not new. It's not sexy. You can buy it over the counter in Japan if you have heavy periods or even headaches. And um, they tell me it will save lives just like I do. That's rather inconvenient, upsetting, and quite frankly abhorrent to how I do business. So I thought I would help all of you out today by presenting you with a manual or a handbook, if you like, to help you through this difficult um, situation. So this is the Tranexamic Acid Deniers Handbook. This is strategies to help you avoid using tranexamic acid in your hospital to stop those people who want to use tranexamic acid in their hospital or in their pre-hospital environment and to allow you to convince at least yourself, if not others, that what you are doing by avoiding the use of tranexamic acid is the right thing. So I'll present you with a number of strategies to do that. But first of all, we need to sort of encapsulate the problem. The problem in trauma, apparently, is that there is this stuff called blood clots, which a lot of which is made up of fibrin, the blue stuff in this picture. Blood clots are quite important. They're not as important as my perfect suturing technique, but they're quite important. And unfortunately, in trauma, apparently, there is a massive lysis um, going on that actually dissolves those blood clots. So, and up to 60% of severely injured patients have a severe underlying lytic problem so that any blood clot they're trying to produce is just dissolving away in front of them. So apparently there's this underlying lysis which stops the blood clotting. It's not going to dissolve my sutures, but it is going to dissolve the clot around them. 
And then these foreigners had the audacity to conduct this half-baked randomized control trial and to actually look whether an anti-fibrinolytic agent was any good in improving uh, outcomes after injury. And they had the audacity to enroll 20,000 patients around the world, and they fluked out with a 15% mortality relative risk reduction. So people who got tranexamic acid for some reason or another in this randomized controls trial had a lower mortality than those who didn't. That's annoying. There have been other studies since then. One in the military, two in the military actually, another in civilian. They've all shown that this drug appears to do better things for trauma patients. Actually, and I wouldn't mention this in your arguments, before the CRASH-2 trial came out, there were 76 randomized control trials of tranexamic acid in other bleeding or surgical situations, all of which essentially together showed a benefit for tranexamic acid. Now, it's best if we forget about those for the purpose of the discussion and just focus on the trial in hand because um, that's much easier to deal with. So, here are our strategies for getting over this evidence. The first strategy, deflect or diminish the issue. Now, you all know how to do this because we do this every day uh, and we have to listen to this every day. Instead of calling something global warming, we call it climate change, and that sounds much better to us. Instead of calling something um, murder, we call it gun control, uh, and uh, you know, it goes on with uh, uh, all sorts of things in our daily life. It's a bit harder to do that uh, in trauma, but one thing that we can do is pretend that we can't say the name of the drug. <laughs> so, tranexamic acid, it's a little complicated. Um, and so here are a number of possible options for you. When people start to talk about it, you sort of look at them askew and try and repeat it. Uh, you know, so, traxinamic acid, trasinamic acid, taxidermic acid, trixie dixie acid transanemic acid, you know, it all sort of deflects, you know, what's this guy talking about? Um, it all sort of tries to deflect away from the, the issue in hand. It all sort of sets the tone for your strategies later. The study is a multi-center randomized clinical trial called uh, STAMP, which stands for the study of transemic acid during air medical pre-hospital transport. We are uh, studying the drug transemic acid, transemic acid, Transemic acid, transemic acid, transemic acid. Okay, so now, you know, you've got people confused already. You know, they don't actually know what we're talking about anymore. This is all very helpful for our, our strategy. Unfortunately, people have come up with a short form of it called TXA, which most people can remember and can say. So that's a little bit um, tricky for these arguments. Okay, next strategy. This is the big one. This is actually what you can do with any clinical trial, is that you can forget about how difficult it is to conduct clinical trials and you know, how it, the pain of actually setting it up and running it, and just pick it apart as you feel um, best. So this works for any clinical trial that you want to read if you disagree with the results. Um, and so this is strategy number two, disrespect the study. This has a number of subparts. Strategy 2A. Disrespect the results. This bit's quite easy. 20,000 subjects, 15% relative risk reduction. What does that actually mean? Well, in the placebo arm, 5.7% mortality. In the uh, treatment arm, 4.9% mortality. That is only a 0.8% absolute risk reduction. Convert that into a number needed to tweet. Number needed to tweet. Number needed to treat by dividing it by a dividing 100 by 0.8, you get a number needed to treat of 125. I have to give this drug to 125 patients to save one life. That is a big number. Now, what you mustn't say at this point is that it's really, really cheap, that it costs $3,000 uh, uh, approximately for every daily that you save for a trauma patient. So you could actually give about 
um, up to number needed to treat, so around 600, and it would still be cost-effective for trauma patients. Don't say anything like that. Just say what a big number, number needed to treat of 125 is. So that means, essentially, that they said for the 10,000 patients in the trial that got tranexamic acid, 80 lives were saved. That's quite a big number, but it's not as big as 125, so that's good. The investigators did a bit of a sneaky thing. They tried to look at people who may have had more benefit from the drug, and so they did a second uh, sub-study looking at deaths due to bleeding, published that in The Lancet um, as well, and it did indeed have a bigger uh, effect there, so 7.7% mortality down to 5.3%, 2.4% absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat of 42, still a big number. We're still clear. Now, there is a little bit of a problem with this, which we can use in our, our strategy, though. So CRASH-2, if you plot baseline risk against number needed to treat, the absolute risk reduction is not a useful measure for how you apply the clinical trial results to the patient in front of you or the patient population that you are treating. The absolute risk reduction, or the number needed to treat, only applies to the study population. Now, the CRASH-2 study population was relatively mildly injured. And so they had a low baseline mortality of 5% or so. Even in the bleeding patients, they only had about a 7% mortality. These are patients suspected of, uh, of bleeding. So this is a low severity study, so the effect size is small. The thing that you can track through different patient severities is actually the relative risk reduction. So if we look at those other two studies... Uh, for example, the two cohort studies, which looked at patients who were massive transfusion patients or code red patients. The Royal London study has a much higher baseline risk, the military matter study, an even higher baseline risk. The number needed to treat is coming right down now to about five, seven. If you look within those at the shock patients for the Royal London, the massive transfusion patients for the matter study, now you're right down. They have a much higher baseline risk, the effect of tranexamic acid is much higher, the number needed to treat is now five or thereabouts. So this is inconvenient for our strategy. It means that the sicker the patient that we give, the more likely tranexamic acid will save them. But this is maths. Most people don't understand maths, so you can just sort of blow over this bit quite easily and stick with a number needed to treat of 125, and it's you know, a waste of time and money. Okay, next strategy. Disrespect the study design. They didn't measure anything to do with blood clotting. How can you do a trial of a study that looks at something that improves supposedly blood clotting, and they didn't measure blood clotting? Never mind that, they did a trauma trial and they didn't me measure the injury severity score. Every trial ever, ever done in trauma measures the injury severity score and they did not measure the injury severity score. What kind of trialists are these people? In fact, their patient entry form was so Mickey Mouse that it was only two sides uh, of patient detail to actually capture. How can you possibly have any reasonable trial where you don't collect at least two binders worth of information on every patient? Now, it turns out that this is what's called a pragmatic clinical trial, where you measure the variables that are important and you remove the variability by doing such a large trial that any variability within it is taken away. And you look at the outcomes that you're interested in, which are things like mortality. And because you're doing a 20,000 um, patient trial, you can do away with the rest. You do a pragmatic trial so that you can enroll 20,000 patients. You make it easy for the researchers to do the trial. So slightly annoying that it is actually a valid way of doing a trial, um, but we'll just move on. Disrespect the study. Dis the ethics. In the study, this is how you enrolled a patient. You enrolled them unless you thought that the drug would work, in which case you gave it, or you thought that the drug didn't work, 
It wasn't going to work, in which case you wouldn't give it, and you would only give the drug if you were substantially uncertain as to the appropriateness of antifibrinolytic agents in this patient. What kind of a trial is that? Well, unfortunately, again, that, that is clinical medicine, that is clinical research, because that is equipoise. You cannot ethically do a trial unless you are uncertain about whether a drug will work or not. So if you are going to do a clinical trial of an investigation product, you must give the treating clinician researcher equipoise in that trial. So it is a way of stating equipoise. But we can use this in our argument. You know, it's everyone who would benefit, they didn't give it. People I know would benefit, I would have given it, though, though I don't believe in it, so I wouldn't give it. Disrespect the study. Disrespect the subjects. Over half of the people in this bleeding study didn't, give, didn't get any red blood cell transfusions. What kind of a study is this of bleeding trauma patients where these patients didn't even, half of the patients didn't even get any red cell transfusions? Well, of course, if you go to Nigeria or many of these countries, you actually can't get red cell transfusions unless your relative gives a unit of blood for you or you go and buy a unit of blood. So actually red cells aren't available for a lot of these patients. So it's not that these patients weren't bleeding and didn't need red cells, it's that red cells weren't available. And using a uh, number of transfusions as a measure of how much you're bleeding maybe isn't the best measure uh, anyway. And of course it's not the shiny trauma centers that we're used to where everything is available and you know we have things like raptor sweets which are as good as tranexamic acid and we have plasma and we have lots of plasma and we can get as much plasma as we want into these patients as quickly as we want now plasma it does have a little bit of antifibrinolytics in it. It's got antiplasmin and things, but it's only in physiological concentrations. So it's not really doing an antifibrinolytic job. But I believe in plasma, um, and I've put my life into plasma, and there ain't no foreign drug going to come along and take over from the good yellow stuff. So if you have plasma, you use it. And ultimately... This study was not done on Americans. It doesn't matter whether it worked on everybody else in the world. <laughs> this study was not done on Americans. Now, we may be different from Americans. Americans may be different from us, genetically. <laughs> Americans are certainly different. <laughs> but it probably still works in Americans. Disrespect the investigators. The investigators in 20,000 patients had 99% follow-up. 99% follow-up. How many trials do you know have 99% follow-up? Liar, liar, pants on fire. There is no way that could have happened, even though it was a pragmatic trial and it was really easy to do the follow-up, there is no way that that could have happened. These investigators must be lying. Now, it's quite something to, to call a lie and to actually accuse investigators of lying. Um, so you have to be sure... And unfortunately, you can download all the data from the crash trial, including the um, follow-up forms from the crash 2 website, should you want to. Um, but nevertheless, 99% follow-up is not on the whole believable, so we'll ditch it. And anyway, this is what scientists look like. They look at things in glass bottles. They wear white coats and ties and they are preferably white. <laughs> These people are not scientists. These people are not scientists. How can these people be scientists and researchers? How can these people be scientists? These people have white coats, but they don't speak English. They are not scientists. How can you do a science if you do not speak English?
Strategy three, scaremongering. Pulmonary embolism. You do not want pulmonary embolisms. <laughs> if you give a clotting drug, you will make people clot. You will give them pulmonary embolisms. Actually, it turns out in CRASH-2, only about half a percent of the patients got uh, any thrombotic complication. It was the same in both groups. If you make people survive more, you will get more complications and you will get more of these. But actually, if you correct for it, people who get their clotting treated better tend to get less of these. Nevertheless, it is scary to get pulmonary embolisms. Many people would... You, I know you would rather have a pulmonary embolism and be dead than be alive and have a pulmonary embolism. <laughs> Make something up. Fibrinolytic shutdown. It sounds really good. It sounds really scary. Undoubtedly, some patients have something called hypofibrinolysis, those patients seem to come in under lytic, and they seem to do worse. We don't really know why. Hypofibrinolysis doesn't sound very, very good. Call it fibrinolysis shutdown, and no one will ever give tranexamic acid to those patients, even though it may not make a difference uh, to their outcome. The final strategy, publish something else, anything that says that those people were wrong. Something like this. a cohort study from an American trauma center, a level one trauma center. We looked at patients who did and did not get tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid increased mortality. Boom. And that turns out that people who got tranexamic acid were a lot sicker than the people who didn't. Um, it also turns out that the baseline mortality in this center is worse than the military study in uh, Iraq, but we won't go there. <laughs> <clears throat> this works, believe me. Pull out this one, and you can't say the name. This works every time. So, you now have all the strategies in hand to avoid the evidence, to use for yourself in the mirror, for your trauma center to say, this stuff is dangerous. This stuff is foreign, and it kills people by pulmonary embolism. <laughs>